want to check on both for the college fund. Oh, we merged them into one report? Yeah. No, that's I, I, I'm looking at the agreements. So we'll just make sure we're in the both. Okay. And we'll see if you want to or not. <laughs> it's your right to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I just I just have somebody else take over this because okay. it's old. Yeah. It's this morning and afternoon is good. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I feel bad. I'm taking the town. Sort of sad. Next year. Yeah. 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 It's Thursday night, right? Yeah. 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 Yep, because Friday the 13th is a good one. So that's why we're going to take the next one. Call the meeting to order. Um, we'll move on to our merged mental health policy and SEL update. Do you mind taking that? I am. There we go. It's on now. <laughs> having a slight bit of trouble having it start up. But. Uh, this afternoon's presentation and the work session is based around social emotional learning and part of it just to, to go through uh, as you'll see as we, we uh, show you some of the information that we've put together for you to present on the social emotional learning and some of the aspects of how we incorporate it into the everyday life of the students and our staff. Uh, you may recall last spring we had a presentation by our high school counselors there was uh, from each of the schools, um, the traditional three high schools, Washington, Lincoln, and Roosevelt, the department chair for the counseling department presented on the services that they provide through counseling. That at that time was titled SEL and, and counseling and counseling services. Uh, truly, when we look at it, at that time we went through the numbers of the counselors that we have and the support organizations of our community and, and city. Um, and so when you see the term SEL, that is part of it. At that time also, they talked quite a bit about using really what is the gold standard in, in social emotional learning, which is CASEL, and so many of the things that are based on CASEL. Uh, CASEL is the collaborative, um, academic, uh, social, and emotional learning, and each one of those pieces. And a key piece of that of CASEL is that academic piece. Uh, there are several schools that incorporate that academic piece as a significant portion, it could be a standalone programming that they have, or many of which incorporate into several areas of their school life. One part that we presented at that time was the counseling component of that. We do have with the Sioux Falls School District over 70 school counselors. We also bring in outside uh, agencies like Southeast Behavioral Health, and there's almost about 40 counselors that, that come with between LSS, the PATH program, uh, Southeast Behavioral Health, and other counselors. That in and of itself is the counseling component of SEL, but is not SEL at all. SEL, as you'll see as we go through uh, and show you really an overview of it because it's, there's so much to it that you can't give the whole presentation. Um, counseling is one part and weaves itself in. The academics is one part and weaves itself in. And so really, when we looked at that last spring, that is one component of what we do for SEL. Today, we'll really give you a broad overview of how we weave that into so many parts of our schools as we go through. And we'll really look at, uh, and, and we've never reached that, that end game, and that we never will. Uh, you always have to continue to change and improve and look for those new areas. And so even the things you see today, that is not the be all, it's just what we're at right now. We'll talk about that, what are some of our next steps that we'll do as well. So we'll take you through the presentation. Um, 
we'll take you through the presentation of information and show you where we're at on things and then talk about some of those next steps so you at least have a pretty good overview of what SEL stands for in our district. So, Good afternoon. Dr. Nold and Dr. Boisen and I are working together um, with groups of staff across the district in this initiative, so we're gonna tag team today. So the SEL initiatives, we're gonna see um, really documented best in our strategic plan through priority statements three and four, which is in priority area two, school culture and climate. Those two priority statements focus around nurturing and safe learning experiences for all students and developing strategies to enhance a culturally responsive workforce. As we show you um, the framework we've started to put together for our district, we have woven priority statement four into the SEL framework um, that we're gonna show you. So that's our logic there. In this year's strategic plan of initiatives, we have these four initiatives that really all have an interface in different parts of SEL. The first, of course, is that we're gonna evaluate the current practices of the district and how that impacts social and emotional well-being of our students and staff, and then to be able to establish if additional initiatives may be necessary. So we've engaged in what we would call more of a needs assessment activity this year, looking at all the components of the SEL, where we are as we look toward planning the future, where we go. We um, are having um, much activity going on around culturally responsive practices that we would say would continue, just weave in the SEL. We have been looking at systems to implement page training for all Sioux Falls School District staff. Page training is that understanding of our inner and exterior biases and how that impacts teaching and learning and relationships with kids. And so we have some ideas we'll bring to you in the budget about that. And then studying the current student assistance team model to have more consistent practices, which is another group that's going on. So what is SEL? We bring you this information from a group called CASEL, which is probably a leading expert in our country on the topic of the SEL. Um, you can go about anywhere nationally to learn about SEL and you will see the frameworks coming out of CASEL. So SEL is how children and adults learn to understand and manage their emotions, set goals, show empathy for others, establish positive relationships, and make responsible decisions. So that's where we are. So we're gonna start next with Brett, who's gonna talk about some of the policy pieces of this, and then we'll come back to some of the Hi, I believe this is my first time addressing the board, so thanks for having me. Um, so following the uh, NSBA conference and um, some receipt of some, some policies from around the country um, from some of my um, colleagues in similar positions, and then also looking at the Associated School Board from South Dakota model policies, I've kind of taken a look at these policies and broken out some common themes um, that we either address um, elsewhere in policy or in practices. Um, so I just want to talk through those quickly. And if you have questions later, you can, you can address them then too. Um, the first place um, that we address mental health in our policies is in section A, which is sets forth the educational philosophy and school district vision, mission, and views. In policy AD, we seek to um, create a learning environment uh, provided for students to acquire knowledge and skills to enhance their own physical and mental health, enabling them to accept themselves and others, the important, in themselves and others, the importance of feelings, dignity, and self-worth. Um, so, so that sets forth the, uh, the vision or the mission of the district. Um, 
that that policy statement in and of itself is, is kind of a passive way of addressing mental health. So then we want to look at okay, what are the procedures and, and, and how do we carry out these policies. And to take a more active role, we're looking at the procedures and the curriculum of the district. And so these discussions um, are built into the strategic plan, um, into the practices and curriculum, and then also into some of the already existing practices of the district, such as um, compliance with regulatory requirements in IDEA in Section 504. Um, based on the guidance and those uh, regulatory frameworks were to construe disability broadly to include mental health disorders. Um, and so as we think about the policies um, and we have policy review, we want to keep mental health in focus and where, where necessary, tweak those policies and procedures to address issues of mental health. Um, another common theme I saw in a lot of these policies were the community partnerships that school districts have. And I think in Sioux Falls, we're, we're lucky to have uh, a wealth of those resources available. Um, while you could put it in, in policy, I think there's kind of an ever-changing landscape of, of who those community partners are. Um, and just so long as you keep in mind um, with those partnerships as we move forward. Um, another common theme I saw was around suicide prevention, um, intervention, and post-prevention. So I just want to kind of make those connections um, as to what I saw in policy and where I see it taking place in the district current procedures. Um, so staff training, um, you're going to see um, that taking place in future prep programs now as a requirement for them to qualify for uh, certification. And then also the new state requirement that they have suicide prevention training on initial receipt of a certificate as well as renewals. Um, in, in student training, you can see it in the curriculum from the counselors to the health classes, and you'll hear more about that from the rest of the people here. Um, on crisis intervention, another common theme as to how school district staff address issues either within the school or as school administrators and, and staff learn of you know, issues of mental health and, and how they deal with students. Um, so the, the first line of that would be the CPI training received by district staff members to address immediate concerns um, regarding um, as mental health issues take place. Um, we, we build it into the discipline policy um, issues where um, student drug use or threatening behavior is, is a part of that. We, we use our uh, partnership with Southeastern to have a, a chemical dependency screen or a risk assessment done, and those are going to have recommendations for what the student can do moving forward. Um, and one of the common things I saw as far as um, those community partnerships was wraparound services. We're seeing those in a lot of policies. And so that, that's what Southeastern can, can help provide at those times when family members and other people in the student's lives are really, they need to be involved in that process as well, and so they can offer therapy um, as well. Um, and then the, the post-vention, um, the, student, the student assistance team takes the responsibility here where I've been seeing a lot of policies, how they address how students, how, how they incorporate the student back into the school setting following you know, perhaps a mental health stay or you know other, other sort of crisis student experience. And so that student assistance team, where necessary, would also um, have a referral to the 504 team or the IEP team where necessary. And that's why it's important to keep that regulatory framework in mind. We have, we have a process set up for that. Good afternoon. Um, I have the honor of doing the next section. So Castle, as we talked to about earlier, is really uh, the foundation across the nation of setting the standard for social emotional learning. And this is what Castle stands for. And I thought it was important for us just to um, bring this forward so you understand their background just a little bit more and for anybody that's listening. But it's 
CASEL believes that social emotional learning is important for all students. So we understand their diversity, their cultures, their backgrounds, our page training that we do with all our staff really helps set that standard also. Um, so levels of playing ground for our staff. It's a systematic improvement, it's not an intervention. And so we need to weave it into all parts of the day. It's not a standalone class, it's, a, it's how we do business. It's how I help um, a student with self-regulation skills, I help a student with um, that is having a hard time because somebody doesn't want to be their friend or they come to school and they're upset about something that happened at home or social media crisis. And so that's, it's really about how we as adults care for those students all day long in any class or in the hallway. And then uh, we uplift students' voice. So we promote that they, they have voice, they have agency, they are leaders in our building and we really do listen to them. And so how do we, as we develop curriculum, how do we embed that throughout the curriculum to help support students? And then we want to make sure we strengthen the adult SEL practices. And so our staff um, throughout the district at every level, how do we help promote that for equity for them and then also help support their skills and um, self-care for themselves also. And then we must engage students, families, community partners in this social emotional development. And we'll show you, um, we collected the information on all those different categories and we'll get into that. So we started with the castle framework and in the center there is the castle wheel. And you can see that outer ring is home and communities. Then we have schools and classrooms. And so we know that it takes all of us to educate the students and our youth in the community. And within that, we have self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, social awareness, and relationship skills. So on the left, we know as a district in a school, if we have, we build strong foundational skills, strengthen the adult SEL in our buildings, promote SEL for students, and practice this continual improvement, we will get the student outcomes on the right side. And on the right side, we start with the long-term goals of we'll have better graduation rates, kids will be ready, um, whether it's college or career readiness, they'll have good relationships, mental health, reduced crime, engaged citizens, that's our goal. The intermediate wins are social behaviors and relationships, academic success, fewer conduct problems, less emotional distress, and less drug use. And our short wins, because we always want to have those short wins, is improved attitudes about themselves and others, and perceived classroom climate. And so that climate's good, I feel good about what I'm doing as a student, um, and my tasks are developed. So that's our goal. So as we look at how we develop social emotional in the Sioux Falls School District, is how are we going to get those outcomes on the right um, and looking at what we already have in place and as we move forward. So we started with, um, we, it was the Deb, Jamie, and Teresa Roadshow, and we went around to all these different groups and collected information and gathered input. We talked to the social workers, the counselors, principal representatives, curriculum services, and supervisors and coordinators. The health committee started this year um, with their steering committee really looking at that health curriculum, so it was a perfect opportunity to meet with them. And then we met with the curriculum council, and that brings in community members, university representatives, teachers, parents, and um, all of, at all levels. And so we collected information, and we developed our SEL wheel. So this is the Sioux Falls District's information on what do we do to address social-emotional learning in Sioux Falls, and we have a left, we call this our pinwheel, and we adapted it from Castles, and we have explicit SEL instruction. We have, uh, I can't read that red one from there. It's SEL integrated academic instruction, youth voice and engagement, because we talked about how important that is. Supportive school climate and cultures focus on adult SEL because we can't forget about the adults in the building. Um, supportive discipline, and um, Brett touched on that. A continuum of integrated supports. Authentic family partnerships. So there again, there's that ring on there. It's schools, classrooms, homes, 
community, and then align community partnerships, systems for continuous improvement, and we added safety because safety is a, a big part of that. So within this wheel, if you, they're all hot links, and so if you click on a hot link, so under explicit instruction, it gives the definition of explicit instruction. And then we collected as a district, what do we do to support the students in this area, the staff, what district resources do we have, and then who are our community partners. And so we're gonna show you just a couple of those, um, knowing that this is an ongoing process, but this, is, this gave us a place to start. So we're gonna look at focus on adult SEL and aligned community partnerships. And I have to jump out of this. So focus on adult development. So staff have regular opportunities to cultivate social, emotional, cultural competency. And this is where we put um, culturally responsive and social, emotional learning together and building trust relationships and maintaining a strong community. So under staff, student support, um, we have, uh, so that's, and remember this is adult SEL. So under student supports, we have project warm up, Avera wellness, autism team training, backpack program, staff supports, there's our page training, the trauma informed online academy. And that's been a big push this year in many buildings. Um, where they're, they work through online courses together as a staff and they're seeing really building that empathy for students and understanding, but it also helps them to develop their own social emotional, that self-awareness for them. Book studies, NAMI, ACEs, and you can read that list that goes on for staff supports. And some are very individualized. Friday forums, in-service, you know, even staff meals for conferences. That's important so that they feel that they're appreciated. Um, sunshine, social socials groups, building data retreats to really look at that information, student assistance teams, and PLCs at um, personal learning communi communities. And then here's our district resources. They have data retreats, in-service, collaboration, community supporting events, district-wide IEP health sessions and behavior teams, and it continues. And there's our community partnerships under this. And so when we look at this, and we look at all those 11 spines of the pinwheel, um, part of it is that ongoing evaluation of it. And that was the adult. And then if we skip over to align community partnerships, because it, our community is so supportive, and when we start to look at all those relationships out there, um, this is really making sure we have the common language and strategies, SEL and CRP, culturally responsive practices, and how do they work together on that audit. So here's our student supports. Pathways LSS, VOA, Backpack, Southeast Behavioral Health, Harmony, Helpline, Sioux Falls Cares, we continue to scroll down. Girls on the Run, and that was one of the, that is mentioned under Castle as one of the SEL, Junior Achievement, Avera Academy, LSS, Police Department, Junior Achievement, we have them listed twice, teammates, um, e-clinics, wellness committee, you know, all our university partners, um, Avera Behavioral Health, we can continue to go, and then let's challenge the dental mobile, Let's go to the next staff supports. There's some staff supports there and district resources. And then we get down into community partnerships. And many of these look the same as the student because they duplicate them. Night of Hope and Caring, 52 Mentoring, Private and Parent Donations, Police Department. Continues to So that's our, our efforts on moving forward, on collecting information on each of those 11 pinwheels. I have to get back in here.
And so looking at, again, what are we currently doing and where are we collecting information, our strategic plan, we are collecting information along with that on graduation rates. And two meetings ago, you saw this information and the metrics on that, graduation rates, attendance rates, students are feeling supported at, at safe at school, they, they feel, staff feel safe at school, behavior reports, student re adults have high expectations and parents reporting teachers hold their students for high expectations. Those are through our climate survey and that reevaluation, and we'll do that survey again that um, has been created by the district to gather that metric and we, we, we give you that information. And as I mentioned earlier, the health committee started their steer, uh, we started with our steering committee last, this fall, 2019, and really looking at um, how we redefine that K-12 health curriculum. And they wrote this vision and mission statement, and we were sitting in there just two weeks ago, and we said this is a perfect alignment with what we're doing. So the health education encompasses the physical, mental, and emotional, and social well-being. It's an essential component of the district's curriculum. There again, we <coughs> embed it in the curriculum. And the health curriculum focuses on empowering students to function optimally and glo as global citizens and prepares them for an the demands of the changing world. And so next year, that committee will start to really look at that curriculum for K-12 and that alignment, which focuses in on our next steps of what we're gonna continue to do within the school district. So a lot of the information you saw there is really a overview of, of all the different veins that come together to support the SEL within the school district. There is not one set curriculum. Uh, it's really embedded in all those things. And many of the school districts that we have looked at model in that same way. There's not a set curriculum you utilize or it's not just your counseling program. It's really all those things that you do and support. A couple of the sessions even went to it in the last professional development was even what they do in the classroom for the engagement aspect and the teaming of the students because the more those students can work together at a younger age, the more they become more accepting and knowledgeable of each other's backgrounds. So some of the things that were still going on and, and moving forward with student assistance team, that review has started here this spring uh, to go through to make sure that we have very similar practices, at least the core practices at our elementary, that they're gonna be similar in how they, they work on the student assistance team. The middle schools, similarities there, and then in the high school, so we make sure that we address uh, the student needs. Our counselor curriculum review. Um, in the high school, a lot of that is the career uh, assessments and then the career advancement to look into the careers that the students may be interested in. That's combined into our English course with courses and they utilize that time to be able to go in and do that, that uh, career inventories. The elementary and middle school, with the elementary, it's much more so than going into the classroom and working with the students and then in middle school in the pro times. We also have uh, the wheel that you had seen there that we are utilizing to go through to now see where do we have gaps? Where are there areas that we still need to create better programming or bring in other entities within our community to be able to support the students within the social emotional. So really it's helped us kind of look at an overall, overall view of the school district of what do we currently have where do we possibly have some gaps to continue on the review of some of these areas so we continually update that and then build the program and can be able to fill in those gaps. Uh, this last part of it, it was probably, and you can read that statement, I will not, but the key piece of it is it's absolutely not just a 20 minute session that we would do each and every day. Um, I started out talking about the counselors and we do when you look at just our school counselors, 70 school counselors, uh, 10 social workers, um, 10 success coordinators, the 40 counselors that come in from Southeast Behavior Health and LSS PATH, that really is not a standalone SEL program. It's interwoven in every one of those spokes that come out because they have an active role in each part of that, whether it's with the adults, whether it's with our community, whether it's with just our student or the academics. Um, so if you look at it in and of that, counselors are one piece but they're all combined together to help the students throughout the entire day. 
And that's truly what we tried to do with that wheel is, is look at where are all the components that we have and how do we bring that together as one and then start to look at the gaps that we have. Questions that you have or information that we can go back over or discuss with you. Thank you for this report. Um, I know it's been an issue we've all as a board, especially after attending uh, an SBA, wondered exactly what we're doing as a district in a deep dive. So we appreciated all the information provided. Um, I had two questions. Uh, first, with the boundaries changing in middle school and high school that we're discussing, how, what is the game plan for our district to make sure that since students are moving and they're then going to encounter new staff, that they are trained appropriately for maybe new behaviors, cultural diversity in their, that new building for them. And part of that we have discussed uh, as we begin to go through, because so many of the staff that we're gonna have are gonna be current staff within the district. And how do we, uh, and Dr. Myers talked on that a couple different times or, or brushed on that, that how we're gonna have that the new staff selected that will go into that building, many of which will be in our district already. Some will be new hires, just like it is at all schools right now. But it is not that our district will be adding a thousand new middle school students. They'll be coming from the other middle schools or, or 1,800 new high school students. They'll be coming from the other schools. So many of our staff will be trained. Part of that we will bring forward in the, the budget, at least on staffing, is the page training and how do we help and interact with the students that we work with on a daily basis. Uh, many of those things also in hiring um, the principal and the activities director is to start to set some of that culture up for that building well in advance. And that'll be done both at the middle school level and the high school level. So we do have that in place and, and to allow them, especially when they start to head into that hiring process, to begin to look with the department chairs that will be hired for that next year and how do they set up, what are going to be the protocols and what are going to be the things that they utilize for the culture. Hiring of the activities, that's going to be a critical piece of it uh, as they go through and, and determine those parts because uh, even as we'll see later on, um, we want to make sure we answer some of those questions that the activities will be there and, and will be ever present. The counselors will be there. Um, all those programs that, that you currently receive services for at your current school will be found at the, the two new schools that they would move into. Thank you. President, you can take one. Sorry. Uh, I could add that um, typically in the past, as we've opened new buildings or had significant changes in school boundaries, um, as a leadership team, we've usually laid out categories that we need to make sure get addressed in that year before everything from having enough textbooks to how do we set up opportunities for kids to begin to meet and, and interact to the things Dr. Hall just talked about. So I would anticipate once we have boundaries set, we as a leadership team will need to lay out for the existing the buildings as well. Yeah, for everybody that, that's significantly impacted. How do we lay that out? And what are all the things we have to think about from books to all those pieces. So typically, if we, we've laid that out in some kind of a written fashion. We've said, you're in charge of this part, you're in charge of this part, you know, give this to these people, and it's all been laid out the time. Boundaries and leadership, building leadership probably, right? Yeah, and that's what Dr. Nold was referring to. That's a key yeah. first step. Get your leaders in place, and then they're part of this process of laying out all the things question I had about um, the pinwheel mm -hmm. you that said that was an interactive um, it is so is it on our website is it a resource for our teachers community parents it is not on there yet no okay. you were the first to be able to see it outside of the okay and it is definitely something that our you know, we have been working through with each one of those groups that we had listed. Uh, they were accessing and they were putting the information in there and then we'll go back to them to see where do we have some of those gaps mm -hmm. and answers. Many of the things you saw on there were district-wide. Uh, so the two examples of that pinwheel, they're really district-wide things we do. There's so many buildings that do some more specific mm -hmm.
this one? What measurements, what measurement tools are you using for student learnings? How are you measuring that So if we look back to yep. Um, so for student outcomes, of course, we're looking at all of our uh, metrics that we use within the district if you're talking academic. Um, so, you know, we use our MAP data, we use the South Dakota assessments, we use our district semester tests, we use teachers use formative, that's academic. But these are right now the, the measurements and the metrics that we use that are included in social emotional learning. So our graduation rates, our attendance, uh, and then um, behavior reports, the buildings look at those. And then if you look at these four right here, students reporting they feel safe, staff reporting they feel safe, and um, students have adults with high expectations and parents reporting teachers hold their students to high expectations. Those are in our climate survey. And we'll continue with those and we've expanded those questions um, as we deploy that survey this spring to add, to gather additional information. And so that's how we're getting, and we'll survey students, staff, and families. We, we have done that in the past with these four questions um, on our climate survey, but we've expanded that climate survey and we'll still ask the same groups as we have in the past. Does that Yep. And those were um, at that strategic one. Doug Morrison indicated that forty. It was in that. Yep. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yep. No, that's good. It is. Well, and if and we talked about putting the the percentages up here, but we had just done that um, a couple of weeks ago, and so we thought, well, we know we can still access that because that reports out there. So yes, it is good to look at. And, and it's a good question there because we did utilize the Gallup poll for numerous years. Um, now we're taking uh, questions that we have more specific with our district and incorporating those questions into our climate survey that we'll send out. So our climate survey will be slightly longer than it has been before because uh, we'll put it into one survey and it'll be taken by the students, by staff, and by the parents. And a little more specific than the general. It is. Yep. And, and uh, yep, absolutely. And, and we just created our own, went through a multitude of uh, questions, um, narrowed it down to ones that really benefited our school district and still helped us to answer any of the strategic plan questions. Any questions? Uh, Doug Morrison uh, has taken the lead on that part. How many, I just went through and took that survey, how many questions were on the survey for the student part outside of CT? Probably 10? Yeah. Less than 20. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's, right. that's, that's I like the gal. Yeah, so it's yeah. all questions. The nice thing about this at work and rewriting the survey. Yeah, the nice thing about rewriting the survey is, like um, Doug said, it branches off so we get specific, but we can also drill down to um, staff groups mm -hmm. and students, how they respond to give us better feedback so we have actionable items. Because with the Gallup, we couldn't drill down that far. And we didn't, you know, you might get a response, but we don't know any other details and how do we change it if we don't have that information. So, so this way we get more information, but not really the number. Yep, correct. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and even when you reference that, uh, seniors, so that they don't have multiple other surveys to take, there's incorporated, incorporated into that having the senior survey in there as well. So they click that they're a senior, they'll have a couple more questions. If they click that they're in high school, elementary will have by far the fewest. Um, they may only have eight. Besides, I'm in elementary and what elementary school? And there's about eight questions. Uh, the high school will have a few more because CTE. Middle school has a few CTE as well, and we have to utilize that because of the perp and, and the funding there. So we tried to incorporate a few of those different ones into one and still keep it you know, I was gonna say, I remember taking this, I think it's the survey that we're talking about in the past, and I always thought, you know, I've always had kind of kids in two different schools, and it never really gave me the opportunity to differentiate between how I felt about one group versus another. And so um, I'm glad to hear that you have 
added or changed that and are able to differentiate that um, for this time around. Um, and then can you just remind me who is on our student assistance teams and when are they activated per se? Every school, uh, every single school has a student assistance team. Um, generally speaking, if there's a success coordinator, they will be on it. Administration will be on there. Counselor will be on there. There could be some other support staff that may be as well. And then a lot of times it will have the classroom teachers, uh, special education. So a lot of that will depend in the high school one. Every one of those is represented at each of the, the meetings. Um, in the elementary, I believe it's the same. Of that. Yep. In the elementary, uh, they exactly counselor, admin, teachers, and a variety of levels, social worker possibly. Sometimes they'll invite the parents in. And so every structure looks different. Some have a K-2 SAT team and some have a 3-5. Just that way they can address those needs more specifically. And so is that um, similar to, let's say that we have, obviously we're talking about mental health issues, so we may have a student who's dealing with something and we bring in that team to directly help that student. Is that the same group of people who let's say we there's a tragic car accident or something and a student is lost, is it, it's a different team it's that we utilize team. to support for that. Yep, and okay. Patty Lake Torbert, uh, the head of our student support services, she coordinates the efforts of, of a emergency response team. Okay. Uh, so that team would come in with any type of a tragic event and that is gonna be predominantly built with the counselors. Okay. Um, and that group that would come in now, depending on what the emergency response is, it could be more significant, but the mass majority of which would be a, a group of counselors that come into the building and help and assist within that building. Okay. The student assistance team is something that would meet at the school on a regular basis. Teachers uh, could be parents, uh, administration. They'd make recommendations to the team to review this individual. Uh, and it could be that there may be a, a concern for a need of a 504 special education services or uh, any other type of service. It could be just that they're falling behind on some academics, changes class schedules. So they, they really have a gamut, of a whole list of things that they can utilize to review. That's why I wanna make sure as we go through and do the study on that, that we look at that there's consistency of a base of things that they need to review at every school so that's not missed. And then there's other things they may add in that are unique to their school. And the students, student assistance team can be either um, recommended by the school to the student, or it can also come the other direction where a parent could just come in and say, I'm feeling like we need help. Is that true? Okay. Yep, absolutely. Okay. And, and now if it's a parent asking for some of those helps and services because of needs they have at home, um, it may be a social worker that helps and back sheds them. If it needs to connect them to resources in the community. If it's really dealing with that school and, and academic uh, outcomes or things at the school that student assistance team. Thank you. What I love is that it's for all students, not just who we might think of at, at risk because we truly need to take a look at all at all of our students and staff um, to make sure that we are providing the supports we can for everybody. Um, as we all have been learned through trauma informed uh, learning and so forth that it's, it, it's just, we have to have the skill sets to deal with these students. So it is, in closing on that, it truly is, there is no one program. And it has to be things that we, in court, because every single piece, some student may need the counseling services, some students may need the outside counseling services, some may need uh, just that general interaction in a classroom to feel part of group of others and begin to get to know each other and part of that is how we do that teamwork within the classrooms or some may need all of it. Uh, so there is not one prescribed uh, outcome for each student or pathway for each student to be able to reach that. It really has to be a, a whole gamut and that's where we started on that to start to see where we're missing some of those pieces. Uh, some key pieces would be those studies but then look at other small things because it could be so unique to some students. Yeah, I, I agree with Kate. It would be great to have that wheel on our website, just even for information to our students and parents and staff that this is what's available and you know, they might be able to reach out. Any other questions before I open the public input? Mary? No. Thank you. We'll move on. No public input on that. We'll move to board committee reports. Uh, Carly, would you like to start? 
Um, and they have to, I, I wrote it down, I forgot it. Um, so I'll start with insurance. Um, and we uh, met last week and we went and we were looking at um, next year's kind of projected rates and changes. And um, so everyone got a document to take back with them to speak with their uh, appropriate groups. Overall looking at about a 2% overall increase um, for next year. Um, I'm trying to, the memory, if I, uh, we are below our um, amount that we have spent. And so we're looking at um, a potential for either a premium holiday or a partial premium holiday. We're gonna reassess that in March when we get a little bit further into the year and feel um, safer in doing so. Um, I think 80, just random numbers, like 81% of all of our claims, we have about 21 million in claims and about 81% is medical and 19% is pharmacy types of things. So interesting. Um, and other specific things. we talked a lot about the plans for next year and got kind of feedback. Um, and then what we were gonna be looking at going forward, we've done a really nice job of kind of keeping those um, rates level um, and keeping our contributions from employees um, lower and the district has been um, taking in a lot of that. So how can we maintain that, but also make sure that we're minimizing some of our risks. So um, good conversations and look forward to more next time. Um, calendar, we had really good conversation um, this last meeting. We unanimously, everyone that was there agreed on the calendar, so that was monumental. Um, <laughs> and I don't know, Kate, you wanna talk about some of your suggestions that you brought up that are being tossed around? Yeah, well, I mean, I think um, some of the, we might see some changes to next year's calendar um, yet, so minimal. So if you know, parents don't um, get worried if they already made plans for next year, parents or teachers. Um, we um, did discuss um, the change, possible change in, um, if you recall, Elementary has a early dismissal and middle school has a late start on some in-service days. Um, so we're talking about having those both be um, um, early dismissal so that even though they'll still be staggered, they won't dismiss at the same time, but they'll be, you know, they'll be staggered for busing just as we normally do during the day, but um, at least those younger kids won't be um, necessarily without maybe and I think we get feedback too from parents about the challenge of dropping a middle schooler off at 11 o'clock you know when they're already at work and so if we can try to maintain some of those normal start times and then they can make the adjustments on the back end too so the great idea that he brought up and Jamie was able to do some research and is, is still kind of finalizing a few it things works but out very well and it actually saved the district yeah yeah so yeah you're welcome Todd <laughs> Um, so I'm not sure when we'll see um, the, you know, and that was my purpose, right? <laughs> yeah. um, when I asked the question, um, when will we see, we, will we see these changes for next year yet? Or are we going to wait until later in the spring when possibly we are It'll beyond be the, the need? will bring forward on the 27th, April 27th. April 27th. The, the, the so date. as we approve the next calendar, we will make changes to the, sorry. We'll make changes to the 2021 calendar when we adopt the 21-22. There'll be two separate proposals. Sure. Yeah. Okay. 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 So, so the end of April. And then I'll let you talk about policy. Okay. Um, early childhood head start. Uh, looking at the enrollment numbers to be we're completely full. Um, there is a waiting list of approximately 180. Um, students that combine three and four year olds. The monthly attendance, attendance looks excellent. It sits at right around 94% um, um, for both um, morning and kindergarten. Um, and so they're just off to you know continue to be um, moving in a positive trajectory. Covered Insurance Committee, Education Foundation. We had a meeting yesterday um, but they consistently continue to move in a positive trend. Um, last month, they raised about uh, $50,000. Um, there was a conversation um, with 
Dr. Maher um, looking at the long-term uh, plan for the foundation. Um, the members there felt um, really um, heard and affirmed overall. Um, the action step with that is Brent and Deanne are working with Allison and looking at um, donor recognition, a donor gift acceptance policy, um, and just basically partnerships and overall growth. One thing to keep in mind is the intent of the foundation is not to stifle fundraising of the booster clubs um, or PTA and PTO. It's just a matter of those that are coming in uh, to be able to streamline to the extent possible so that donor recognition is maintained as well as gift acceptance policy um, and really a go-to organization as they continue to grow and develop and evolve. Um, so they keep making some really big headways there. They're also looking at um, endowment um, growth opportunities. Um, and the importance of that is then, as time goes on, they will be able to get more um, off of the endowment as it continues to grow. Um, because you just cannot rely on what donors may be able to give off into the future. So it's looking at forgive forever and really a long-term um, investment for the organization. Um, they're also looking at some new committee ideas, um, primarily as a way to get others involved. Um, they're looking at two new committees, uh, and that may also be a way to feed the overall growth in, in, of the board as, as, terms, um, as terms come up. That's what I have for um, The only other half meets next month, so the only other committee is policy. We met yesterday. Um, we were reviewing five policies, um, one of them being our grading and recovering system policy. Um, we actually are going to um, take, take that back after some discussion yesterday to the middle school and high school principal groups for one more look um, before we bring that back. Um, but that will be a first reading when that comes back, but we won't see it this Monday. So then a second meeting, or what do you think, Jamie? We'll see at the second meeting or perhaps the first meeting in April. So the policy and the meeting. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, so then we'll see four policies Monday that are um, review, revise, very minimal changes, if any. Uh, let's see, budget, we meet next week. Yeah. So we have a little more information. Housing, now uh, we have a meeting. Uh, Sports Authority, uh, the Summit League is coming in the next week. Uh, that should be a, a big weekend. Um, and then the Sports Authority has put NCAA bids out and we've not received favorable uh, responses because of Howard Wood lacking some, um, like a, a warm up area, uh, I believe it was Javelin. The and track. so, yeah, for, uh, sorry, NCAA track. And um, it came to, I'm also on the, Howard Wood Dakota Relay Board. And that board is looking at making improvements to Howard Wood to benefit the Dakota Relays and coordinate with us a little bit so that it would help get future NCAA bids for track and field. Uh, Jeff Kreider's on that. Um, and then both uh, Mark and Casey Miley. So I think we're inching towards an agreement where maybe we can get some things done uh, to Howard Wood that would help us and also help the community with some some bigger events. Uh, that's all. I Thank you, Todd. Cynthia, can I bring up one more thing? Because I feel like I'd be really remiss if I didn't hit this, and it's, it is important. This concerns the Education Foundation. Two things. The first one is that the Education Foundation to know that they do um, restrict funds that people are interested in giving beyond teacher grants. They are not just in the business of teacher grants. Um, giving opportunities go beyond that, most definitely. 
Um, and then number two, there's some dates coming up. We have the Teacher of the Year reception March 9th, for those of you who are on the calendar. Um, they're having a fundraiser at the Barrel House on April 27th. Um, August 6th is their breakfast at Minaha Country Club. And then November 5th, um, they have the public schools crowd, the student um, showcase, which will be at the Santa Fe Farm this year. When is that date again? November 5th. And August 6th is the breakfast. And where's that going to be at again? At Minaha Country Club. And then the 27th is the Barrel House all day. So thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, First of all, I'd like to remind the public that our first uh, community input meeting on the boundaries will be um, March 12th at Memorial Middle School at 5.30 p.m. You do not have to be a parent or a student or a staff member or a community member of the Memorial area. It's open to anyone. So if the future dates after that don't work for you, please come to the Memorial. Come to all of them. If they all work for you, they're open to anyone. So. Um, I know the April 9th one is, gets closer to when we're, you know, going to be starting our work session and so forth. So I want people to know they can come to any, uh, any or all of the input sessions. They don't have to be of that community to go them. Um, uh, as far as my committee reports, the chamber are meeting. Uh, there was a discussion on uh, LifeScape. Jeff Watkins came and presented to that. And also a uh, big news that uh, you might have read in the paper that uh, the CVB now is leaving the chamber and going to be their own nonprofit entity. Terry L. Uh, Schmidt will be, it will be called Visit Sioux Falls. There's big items from that. Uh, Todd touched on budget um, as a, a follow up as well. Remember, we're going to have two uh, work sessions regarding budget um, and at two different times to allow community members, if they want to come listen or hear, they can be, and we move them up in the process so that if they have more questions or so forth, they have more opportunities to do that. And I know Todd makes a big fan of that. I'm just, Todd was very supportive and helpful in that. SE, um, the Sioux Empire Leadership Council, um, I've discussed, you know, the triage project is obviously moving forward, so that's kind of moving out of our wheelhouse. They now have their own board, so they're, we're taking on a new issue and it's uh, making sure that uh, as a community we have the pro proper diversity group for people to feel comfortable in. And it's not one where there already is a commission for the people, Human Rights Commission if they have complaints. This is more to involve more community members so that we're making sure that people who have the issues are being at the table and able to present those in how do we address those? So that's the next topic that's being discussed at Sioux Empire Leadership Council. Still very easy, early in that stages of what that dynamic will look like. Um, and then they will once then become their own acting um, board. They won't have legal authority to do anything. It's more to pr provide awareness and as a resource for people in the community. And that is it. Do I have anything else for the good? Thank you. If not, do you have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. A motion second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, sign. We are adjourned. That's the only word. Yeah. Thank you. That was very informative, guys. Thank you. Oh, yeah.